So, today we are going to be completing our study in First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. Next week we're going to spend some time in the Psalms, and then for the four weeks following that, we're going to be looking at the writings of the Apostle Paul. And today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. So over the last few weeks, I've been reading through all the stories of the kings of Israel and Judah at home. And there's a lot of them. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) some of them are very uh, interesting. And while we could have spent a Sunday focusing on each king, uh, that would be a long and frankly pretty depressing haul. (laughs) And uh, so in addition to that, it's funny, a lot of the kings in the Old Testament, um, descriptions of them and their reigns and, and the things that they did are actually pretty sparse. They're, they're, not, um, they're not very in-depth. And the reason for that is this. So there were two books that were called the books of the annals of the kings, of Judah and of Israel. And they were kept by Israelite and Judaite officials that gave a more detailed history of the reigns of the kings of Israel and Judah. And so First and Second Kings references these books as a form of shorthand all the time. In many places it is written, as for the other events of the king's reign and all he did, are they not written in the books of the annals of the kings? This happens again and again and again. And biblical authors thought we would have those books available to us so that we could reference them. And they didn't want to include redundant details in their own writings. Unfortunately, at some point in history with all the conquest, the burning of Samaria, the burning of Jerusalem, the deportation of the people, at some point, those books were lost. We only have the Bible's references to the monarchy to go on. And while some kings have entire chapters or even almost an entire book dedicated to describing their reign. Other kings are barely a footnote. So preaching on those for a whole Sunday would have been challenging. Um, So what I'd like to do today as we're completing our study is to take a look at Israel's kings from a bird's eye view. When we do this, I think we discover that the kings of Israel had something in common. They had one thing in common. And that common thread is something we should really pay attention to, especially during this time of quarantine. In that common thread, I believe the Lord has a word for us today. So as many of us know, Israel began as one nation, under one monarchy, one king, one government. But in 922 BC, a civil war occurred, and the one kingdom became two. You had Israel in the north, and you had Judah in the south. Today, we're just going to talk about the kings of northern Israel. We'll leave the kings of Judah for another day. And we're going to move through these kings pretty quickly. With each, we're just going to highlight how long they lasted on the throne, what they accomplished, and how they died. And with these basic details, I hope that the trend that they represent becomes obvious to us. So, The final king of the United Monarchy was King Solomon, the son of David. He appointed a man named Jeroboam to be one of his officials. Soon after, a prophet came to Jeroboam, and he told him that the Lord was going to deliver most of the kingdom of Israel into his hands. He was going to rip it away from the descendants of David because of their sin. Well, Solomon heard about that, and despite being a man of wisdom and known as this generally pretty positive figure in many of our sermons, He tried to hunt Jeroboam down and kill him. So Jeroboam fled and went into hiding. Then when Solomon died, his foolish son, Rehoboam, was supposed to become king over all Israel after him. He was the one who caused the civil war in 922 that split the nation. The kingdom was never reunited. Israel and Judah remained separate. Rehoboam fled and became king of the south, and his kingdom was called Judah. His uh, capital city was in Jerusalem, the, the city of David. Jeroboam took this opportunity to return to northern Israel, to seize power, and to become king there. He made his home in Shechem, although the capital of northern Israel was eventually moved to Samaria. This is important. The prophet who came to Jeroboam 
had a very specific message from God. Not just that he was going to tear away the kingdom from Solomon and give it to Jeroboam. The prophet told him the Lord would be with him and would protect his legacy if he remained faithful to God and walked in the ways of David. Jeroboam didn't do that. Um, What he ultimately did, he grew concerned over time that his subjects would return to the Davidic line of kings. They were afraid the two kingdoms would become one and Jeroboam would lose his power. He thought the way that this would happen is the Israelites would journey to Jerusalem to go to the temple to worship the Lord and there have their allegiance shifted. So Jeroboam went and got some advice and his advisors told him, well, why don't you just build some some shrines here? Why don't you just create some idols and then the Jewish people can worship those. Problem solved. And Jeroboam said, that's a great idea. And so he went ahead and created two golden calves, which should be familiar symbols to us from the story of the Exodus. And he placed them at shrines in Bethel and Dan. It was political and religious expediency. He led the people in making sacrifices to pagan gods, And things just really went downhill from there. And so the prophet sent a message to Jeroboam. You done screwed up. That's an abbreviation. What he actually said was that God's judgment was going to pass on Jeroboam and his entire house as a result. And he would lose the kingship. We don't know how Jeroboam died, but we do know that he only reigned for 22 years. If you compare the length of his reign to the reign of the United Kings, he only lasted about half as long. Saul, David, and Solomon all reigned for about 40 years. So his reign was cut short. Jeroboam's son, Nadab, became king after him. Nadab lasted two years on the throne. And he committed the same sins as his father Jeroboam. His reign was cut short when he was assassinated and the entire royal family was slaughtered by a man named Baasha. So then Baasha became king, and he stole the throne away from Jeroboam's line, just as God had predicted. Baasha lasted 24 years, again, about half the length of Saul, David, and Solomon's reigns. And like his predecessor, he did the sins that Jeroboam had committed. He was an evil dude. We don't know how he died, but then his son, Elah, became king of Israel. Elah, like Nadab, lasted two years. He was an evil king. He committed the sins of his father and of Jeroboam. He was also assassinated by one of his officials, a man named Zimri. Zimri then went on and slaughtered every male in the royal family to consolidate his power. Zimri was king of Israel for seven days. He went on a murdering rampage for seven days of power. When Israel heard what Zimri had done, the whole army marched against him. They were rather upset that their king had been assassinated while they were away. Zimri, knowing that his ticket was about to be punched, decided to go out on his own terms. He went into his palace, lit it on fire, and waited inside while it collapsed on him. Seven days was the length of his entire reign. So he committed suicide, and the commander of the army of Israel, Omri, became king after him. Omri was famous for two things. First, he's the one who shifted the capital to Samaria, which was ultimately the main capital city of northern Israel. The other thing he's known for is that he was the father of King Ahab, one of the most evil dudes in the history of the nation. Omri was king for about 12 years. He committed the sins of Jeroboam. We don't know how he died. Ahab became king next. Ahab is famous for being the enemy of Elijah. 
He's the one that Elijah went up against on Mount Carmel. He was the husband of the conniving Jezebel, and he was the evilest king in Israel's history up to his day. He lasted 22 long, bloody years on the throne, eventually being killed by a stray arrow in battle. Jezebel was really the power behind the throne, and she was a super-duper evil lady. She was betrayed by some of her servants, thrown out a window and eaten by dogs. Ahaziah became king after Ahab. He, like Elah and Nadab, lasted two years. Do we see a pattern growing? Do you see what these guys have in common? The cyclical nature of the kingship that's developing? He lasted two years. He committed the sins of his father and his father's father all the way back to Jeroboam. Ahaziah died um, through clumsiness. He uh, fell from the upper level of his palace through a lattice work and eventually died from his injuries. Ahaziah's brother, Joram, became king next. He wasn't as evil as his brother, but still a pretty bad guy. Like his dad, he was killed by an arrow, but he was shot by a usurper named Jehu. Ahaziah committed the sins of his father and the sins of Jeroboam. Ahaziah lasted 12 years on the throne. His usurper, Jehu, not only killed Joram, he slaughtered the entire royal family of Ahab, just like Baasha and Zimri before him. And he also killed the king of Judah. Jehu then became king of Israel, and at first, he was zealous for God. He was loyal. He was a proper Israelite. We know this because God gave him a blessing. God blessed Jehu and promised that he would protect the throne for Jehu's uh, descendants for four generations. After that, they were on their own. But after that, Jehu turned to the dark side, and he became an evil dude just like the dudes before him. He was known for his violent nature and for committing the sins of Jeroboam all over again. He lasted 28 years. Jehu's son, Jehoahaz, became king next. He was evil. He followed in the ways of Jeroboam. We see a pattern emerging. The writer of Scripture is very specific to mention that about every king. He committed the sins of Jeroboam. Jehoahaz is remembered for getting most of the army of Israel destroyed in battle with the king of Aram. It's not a great legacy. That's all he's known for. Jehoahaz lasted 17 years and his cause of death was unknown. Jehoash became king after his father died. He was evil. He committed the sins of Jeroboam. In fact, he was so keen on Jeroboam, he named his son after him. Jehoash lasted 16 years and his cause of death is unknown. His son, Jeroboam II, reigned after him. He was evil and he committed the sins of the house of Jeroboam. He was known for his military exploits and for regaining lands lost in previous wars. He is the only king in northern Israel who lasted as long as the kings of the old days. He lasted 41 years, and we don't know how he died. His son, Zechariah, not the prophet, different guy, same name. That's important. Zechariah became king next. But we remember that God only promised to protect the throne for Jehu's descendants for four generations. And here we are. So, Zechariah was on his own. And he chose to be evil. He committed the sins of Jeroboam. Therefore, he reigned six months on the throne. Then he was assassinated by a man named Shalom, who succeeded him. Shalom became king and lasted one month. He was assassinated too. His assassin was named Menahem, and he succeeded him as king. Menahem was known for brutality and bloodshed. Scripture even mentions that he targeted pregnant women during his campaigns. Super evil guy. Needless to say, he committed the sins of Jeroboam. He's also known for paying a hefty ransom to prevent Assyria from conquering Israel. Assyria was a growing empire at the time. And Menahem lasted a grand total of 10 years on the throne. Pekahiah, 
son of Menahem, became king next. He, like Nadab, Elah, and Ahaziah before him, only lasted two years. He was evil. He committed the sins of Jeroboam, and he was assassinated by one of his officials named Pekah. Pekah became king and lasted 20 years. He was evil. He committed the sins of Jeroboam. Pekah was assassinated by a guy named Hosea. Again, not the prophet, same name, different dude. And Hosea was the last king of Israel. He sat on the throne for nine years. He was evil, but not as evil as the kings who came before him. Scripture says that Hosea served the Assyrian Empire as a vassal. He was Assyria Jr. Still had his independence, but he paid them a tribute. He paid them taxes. He sent them soldiers. But when Assyria got a new king, Hosea got ambitious. And he reached out to the king of Egypt and asked for help to reestablish Israel's independence. In the early 8th century BC, Assyria learned about this treason, and they marched on Samaria. King Hosea was captured and put in prison. We don't know what happened to him after that. He was lost to history. What we do know is that all the Israelites were deported and resettled in Halah, Gozan on the Harbor River, and in the towns of the Medes. Foreigners were settled in Samaria after them. The Israelites intermarried with the locals, lost their culture, lost their ethnic heritage, lost their faith, and Israel was no more. Now, with all that boring history in mind, compare the northern kings with the kings who came before them. This is the trend. This is the important part. So if you fell asleep, wake up, history lesson's over, this matters. The united monarchy of Saul, David, and Solomon lasted about 120 years. Each king reigned for one-third of that time. They each had an equal share. Nobody's kingship got cut short. Even though Saul committed suicide on the battlefield, death on the battlefield was actually a common cause of death for a king, so his reign wasn't cut short. The number 40 symbolizes a generation. They lasted for one generation, which is the appropriate length of reign for a king. Northern Israel lasted a little more than 200 years. During that time, Israel had 19 kings. When compared to the United Monarchy, that's a difference of only 80 years, but 16 kings. If the North had followed the pattern laid out for them, we would have only expected five kings to rule over Israel in that time. But there were 19, quadruple what we would have expected. The average reign of an Israelite king was only 13 years compared to the 40 years of the United Monarchy. Three of the kings sat on the throne for less than a year. One of the kings only made it a week. Israelite kings were assassinated 37% of the time. If you became king, you had a one in three shot of being assassinated. 42% of the time, almost half, the crown was not handed down to a prince in the family line. It was handed down to a usurper. And that statistic would be a lot higher if God hadn't promised to protect the legacy of Jehu for four generations. You wipe that off the map, you're getting closer to half two-thirds territory. Royal families were slaughtered about every two or three generations. As a result, this was a very bloody and unstable government, a government that was supposed to represent God's people. At the beginning of this message, I referred to a common thread among the kings of Israel, a factor which Scripture says was true of every northern king. It's a trend that's important for us to take note of. So here it is. Here's what they all had in common. Every king of northern Israel, whether blood relative or not, followed in the ways of Jeroboam. They all carried on the sins that Jeroboam started. Jeroboam set the precedent. The kings followed it. Kings failed 
to raise their children to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Instead, they taught them to worship the Baals. They taught them to slaughter. They taught them to be violent. They taught them to be ambitious and power-hungry. In Israel, the sins of Jeroboam were handed down with a crown, a crown that was splattered with the blood of betrayed kings. That's what father taught son. And I just wonder, how different would this bleak picture be if they had handed down love for the Lord instead? What if that old pattern of long, stable rules had carried on? What if the crown was handed down, not by assassination a third of the time, but always peacefully, like it was from David to Solomon? How different would the stories of 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings be? The lesson that we learn from 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Samuel should be clear. It's a lesson that we talked about with Eli and his sons. It was, a, it was a lesson we talked about with Samuel and his sons. It was a lesson that we talked about with David and his sons. This whole uh, series of messages has tried to speak to this idea of wisdom and how we should give up everything we have for wisdom. That's what the old proverb said. One of the key pieces of wisdom, maybe the key, piece of wisdom that we pick up from this section of the Bible is well summarized in Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. It's a proverb we've all heard many times before. Train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not soon depart from it. But it's very true positive or negative, a prophet came to Jeroboam and said, okay, listen, chief, Solomon has screwed up. He's turned his back on the Lord. He's become a pagan. He's making all these sacrifices to all these idols. He is, he's doing awful, awful things. He's, he's uh, taxing his own people into poverty. He's forcing people into slave labor like he's Pharaoh. Solomon has, has messed up and God is done. The only reason why Solomon reigned as long as he did was out of love for David and his faithfulness. So God is going to tear away northern Israel and give it to you. Be different. Be like your spiritual grandfather, David. Be a new man after God's own heart, and your legacy will be secure. What did Jeroboam do instead? Like Rehoboam. Rehoboam went and got bad advice. That's how the Civil War happened, right? Jeroboam goes and gets bad advice. That tells him, go and make some golden calves. Set them up in Bethel and Dan. It'll go great for you. That's exactly the kind of stuff Solomon did. He didn't learn. He went to the wrong elders and they gave him bad advice. And and the impact that it had... For us, when we read First and Second Kings, it's just this boring long list of names of dudes who got assassinated. But if you look at the pattern, from father to son, even from king to usurper, someone comes and kills the king, assassinates him, they still carry on what the previous king was doing. The precedent that Jeroboam set was handed down from one generation to another, whether they were blood relative or not. Train up a child in the way they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. Jeroboam had a responsibility. Eli had a responsibility. Samuel had a responsibility. David had a responsibility. Two of David's sons tried to kill him and take his throne. Or, in one case, at least wait him out until he died and take his throne. He raised two traitors and a rapist. David was not a great dad. Train up your children in the way they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. Whether you're a parent or not, 
When you're a part of the family of God, you have a responsibility. We all do. Each and every one of us has a responsibility to raise up young people to love the Lord. And if we shirk our responsibility, there are serious consequences. Israel was God's people. And they went so twisted, God couldn't take it anymore, and he wiped them off the map. That's not who we want to be. That's not who we want to raise our kids to be, our teens to be. We want to be a people that is good, that inspires. One of the things Forrest said as they were practicing this morning was, uh, as we're in this very divisive time, we need to be reminded that Jesus said, the world will know you are my disciples by how you love one another. Do good to others. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Be better than the pagans. This is what Jesus taught us. This is what we have a responsibility to hand on. So there's three things I want to say about that, and then we're going we're gonna to be done for today. Number one, good parenting, whether you're a literal parent or a spiritual parent. I often call the teens my children, and they call me Papa, which is weird. Um, whether you're a real parent or a spiritual parent to young people, good parenting isn't a guarantee. I'm not pretending that it is. There are many people of incredible faith who do their very best in raising their kids, and their kids still end up going sideways. I've known a lot of pastors' kids, missionaries' kids, district superintendents' kids, even a couple general superintendents' kids who've gone off the deep end. And I'm not just talking about they flirted with sin. I mean, they ran in, dove into it, hugged it. One of the most gross movements I've heard about in the last 20 years was started by a pastor's son. Just modern-day hedonism, really trying to stick it to the man, who in this situation is God. Really trying to stick it to God. Just absolutely devoting themselves to sin, the way Jeroboam did. Being a good parent, doing your best to hand on the things that we have learned from God to your kids, it's not a guarantee. So if you're one of those parents out there who has done your best, and kids still didn't go the way you showed them, this isn't a guilt trip. But it is an opportunity. Although it's not a guarantee, that influence can have a really big impact. That's the first thing I wanted to say. Second thing I wanted to say is this. If you're a young person, if you consider yourself to be a young person, I say that because some of y'all are in your early 50s and you still say you're young, so okay. If you consider yourself to be a young person, let me, let me put it a different way. If you consider yourself to be teachable, was that? Oh, I can outrun you, Forrest. You're old. Um, no. <laughs> Forrest just said that I'm outnumbered for that comment. Um, <laughs> if you consider yourself to be teachable, learn from others. Be humble enough to accept the wisdom of those who offer it to you because they've been there. You don't have to repeat their mistakes. Uh, Some time ago, um, I was working with teens, and I had one of my teenagers come to me, and uh, he wanted to, in confidence, so i got to be very delicate about how I, even now, talk about this, but he wanted to confess a sin to me. Uh, He was seeking forgiveness. He felt guilt about it. And so he came and he confessed his sin to me, and he asked me for advice on how to avoid temptation in the future. And the interesting thing was, I had met his parents, and we had had some good conversations. And his father had confided in me, again, 
under confidentiality, that he had struggled with the exact same sin his son was struggling with. And he had gone far deeper off the deep end than his son had. His son was just flirting with the boundary at this point. And I knew that, but because it was in confidentiality, I couldn't tell his son that. So when his son came to me and said, hey, Pastor Ryan, I'm struggling with this, my response was, have you talked to your dad? Have you talked to your parents? Have you, have you run it by them to see what kind of advice and encouragement they could give you? And his response was, oh, no, 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 I couldn't do that. Well, how come? Oh, my parents didn't struggle with this. And it just hit me in that moment. I wanted to scream, but they did! And they could offer you so much good counsel and good advice and help and encouragement. And you would feel some of that guilt wash away because you realize, wow, even dad struggled with this. But I couldn't tell him that. But I did try to encourage him. No, you should really talk to your dad about this. I think he'd be more understanding than you think. It's okay to ask. It's okay to be embarrassed if there's something you don't understand and you feel like you should. Or there's somewhere you feel like you should be and you're not quite there yet. You're still learning, you're still growing. It's a good thing just to walk up to people who have walked the road in front of you, before you, and ask, have you got any advice for someone who's in my stage of life? That's something I do to some of the retired pastors here sometimes. I'll just walk up to them, no warning, I should probably warn them, but I just walk up to them and I just say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm 32, I'm, I'm young in the lead pastor role, do you have any advice? Are there any pitfalls I should watch out for? And they sit there and they go, oh, yeah, I should probably have an answer to that. <laughs> And then they give me good advice. It's solid. I've been able to learn a lot and avoid a lot of pitfalls by listening to others. So, to our young people, think about what kind of a person do I want to become? When, am I, when I'm in my 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, what kind of a man or woman do I want to be? Then go find a person who is that and learn from them. Learn how they got there. Learn what the sins were that they struggled with so that you don't have to. Let them hand on the wisdom and love of God that they've learned to you. Let it transform you and grow you and help you. Look for someone who is living the life you want to live. Learn from them. Don't learn from people who are going to give you bad advice. If their life's a wreck, Maybe not the person you want to give ear to. That's the second thing I wanted to say. So number one, good influence, good parenting, it's not a guarantee. Number two, young people, listen to the advice of your elders. Number three, elders, be intentional. One of the complaints that I've heard as a pastor from folks who are older is that young people never listen. Young people never listen to me. The church isn't giving me enough opportunities to speak into their lives. Rock, 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 rock. And they get kind of grumpy. Sorry, that was disrespectful. Um, but you do, you get kind of grumpy. And um, I get it because you recognize, oh man, I have all this experience and all this wisdom and all this history that I could share with them and they could learn from it but I don't really see an opportunity to share it. Or even, I try to share it and I get blown off. One of the things I've learned with, uh, with working with teenagers and kids and young adults is you have to earn the right to speak into their life, even if you're related. You have to be intentional. You have to be a good listener. You have to, uh, as Jesus said, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. If someone's going to look to you and say, you're the kind of mentor I want to be because you're the kind of person I want to be, then you have to have a relationship with them. You don't start with advice. You start just spending time together. You have to be intentional. You have to earn the right to speak into their life. Uh, when I was early in my ministry, and I started uh, serving with some teenagers, one of the adults who was serving with the youth group 
just walked up to me and basically said, all right, so I'm going to be your mentor. And I was like, says who? He just assumed because I was younger, of course I'm going to listen to him. And frankly, wasn't the guy I wanted to become. So I didn't listen to his advice. And we had conflict. And we had debate. And it kind of slowed things down on the ministry side of things. Until finally we parted ways and I started hanging out with this guy named Chris Canton. Who, for those of you who don't know him, was a former youth pastor here at HNC. And then he became the lead pastor over in Beaverton and now he's living down in Texas. And Chris became a good friend to me and a good mentor. He was the one who helped walk me through my preparation for ordination. And when I looked at Chris, I saw a humble guy. I saw a guy who was a loving guy. He's a good husband. He's a good dad. He's a great pastor. He loves his people. He's patient. He's wise. And one of the things I learned from him that has been written on my heart, obviously, because I'm preaching this message today, is listen to the wisdom of others. That was one of the things Chris taught me, that he really drilled into my skull. There are other people who have been there before you. Learn from them. Be humble enough to seek their advice. Chris did not come and tell me, hey, I'm going to be your mentor. Chris just knew that I wanted to serve with teenagers and I said, hey, and he said, anytime you want to come and hang out with the teens, you know, well, we got a process and everything, but, you know, we'd love to have you come and work with them. And then there were days where Chris would just go get a cup of coffee with me, where he'd share a meal, or we'd just chat on the phone. When I was having rough days living in the Midwest, Chris was one of the first people I called. And he was so encouraging. And he gave me a different perspective. But he invested time in me to earn the right to speak into my life. So if you want to be one of those people that shares your life with others, then you need to be intentional. You need to earn that right. And if you say, well, that's not right, they should just have come sit in my feet and listen to what I have to say. Oh, then it's not really about sharing your wisdom. Now it's just kind of about your ego. And I know that's a rough thing to say, but I remember the words of Jesus. Whoever wants to become greatest among you must become the least. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. One of the things Jesus also said about love, when he came to wash the disciples' feet, he says, you've seen what I have done, now do this for each other. You must become your brother's servant. In 1 Peter it says we must become slaves for God. It's not about us, it's not about our ego. It's about sharing that wisdom, handing down the love of Jesus Christ so that our story reads differently than the story of the kings of Israel. Good influence is not a guarantee. Young people, for the love of Pete, listen to your elders. You can avoid a lot of trouble. Elders, be intentional with young people. Earn the right. Show them that you care about them before you start telling them how to live their life. This quarantine is a great opportunity to be intentional, especially if you have kids in the house, especially if you have teens who live at the house next door. Wherever you have the opportunity to influence parents, especially during this quarantine, your kids are probably watching you more than they do during normal life. They're probably noticing habits more than they do during normal life because you're all stuck in the house together. Mom and dad working from home, kids doing school from home, tempers are probably flaring more, everyone's scratching up the walls to get out. You have an opportunity to earn influence. Young people, you have an opportunity to learn from your parents. So use this quarantine as an opportunity. Learn from the wisdom of the Israelite kings. For their foolishness can be wisdom for us. And so I'll close with this proverb today. There's an old proverb that says, a wise person learns from the mistakes of others, but a fool cannot learn from their own. The Israelite kings were fools. Let's be different. Let's write a different story. Let's hand down the love of God 
to the next generation. Would you pray with me?